When uh, U.S.-based Liberty Media bought Formula One racing in 2017, one of the first things it did was apply a cost cap. As part of a new CNBC documentary, Sarah Eisen explores how Liberty has been trying to reconceive the F1 brand. Team bosses say the cost cap, which limits what they can spend on building and developing their cars, has also made their finances more predictable. Before, somebody investing in a race team didn't know if he would spend 200 million a year or half a billion a year. There was uh, everything in between. Financial stability, in turn, has helped drive a surge in the value of the teams. When we got involved, literally, the, the bottom teams were being traded for zero. Today, I don't think you could buy a team for less than $750 million, and the top teams are valued $3 billion. That's a total change. And, Andrew, the change in finances for the teams has helped lead to the valuations skyrocketing, as Greg Maffei, the CEO of Liberty Media, says. It's just one of a number of ways that Liberty has changed the sport. They came in six years ago when it was a kind of sleepy motorsport that was popular in Europe and South America. And now it's one of the fastest in the U.S. They allowed social media for the drivers, another important um, strategy where drivers weren't allowed to tweet or go on Instagram. Now Lewis Hamilton, the biggest star in F1, has three times the followers of Tom Brady. They signed an important deal with Netflix back in 2019 for Drive to Survive, the docuseries. Just as about just before we were all locked down during COVID and needed some good shows to binge, they really introduced people to the characters in this sport and the, all the drama that followed them, the personalities taking the helmets off. Liberty added a race in the U.S. on top of Austin last year. They added the Miami race and then Vegas this year to really showcase the strategy. Bigger, bolder races full of elevated hospitality. It is a spectacle. They're spending $600 million on this Vegas race. And unlike other races, they are actually the sole promoter where they're in charge of buying the land, building the buildings and the grandstands. It's a huge project. And there's a lot at stake for, for this race for Liberty as they continue to plant their flag in America as a home of Formula One. Sarah, real quick, I want to talk to you about Vegas, actually, in just a moment, because there's a lot of news stories about what's happening there this week and, and, and how this all relates economically. But in terms of the sponsorships, which has been a remarkable success for F1, how, how does it work and how, is, how do the economics get divided among the teams? Great question. So sponsorships are a big part of the success story as well in terms of the financial gains of Formula One. And it's companies that we talk about every day on CNBC, from Salesforce to Amazon. A lot of the tech players are in this because it is a very technologically savvy sport. There are two ways that they can sponsor F1. They can sponsor the league itself or they can sponsor the teams. So full disclosure, CNBC is a sponsor of the McLaren racing team, along with another of other, a number of other brands like Hilton and Goldman Sachs and AWS of Amazon. And it's an interesting symbiotic relationship where the companies don't just get the sticker on the car, but they really work with the teams and share best practices and advice. Right. And in some cases, technology. Palantir is an interesting right. example where they sponsor Ferrari and they're actually using big data and generative AI to help make the car right. go faster. Sarah, just, and, and, and then the Vegas piece of this, and I'm so curious what people are saying on the ground. Uh, there's a, you know, a slew of stories uh, effectively suggesting that F1 overestimated what was going to be possible in terms of the interest in, in, in doing this in Las Vegas. Prices, uh, in some cases, down 70 percent when it comes to hotel rooms, ticket sales itself. Um, they had been trying to charge some of the hotels for viewing space. Those prices came down. What's happening and what's the scuttlebutt around it? So I've read those stories, too, and we actually asked Renee Wilm about this. She's the CEO of Las Vegas Grand Prix, who works for Liberty Media yesterday. She said it doesn't reflect underlying demand at all. When Liberty put tickets for sale for this race, they sold out almost instantly. And part of it is they only released a limited supply. There were less than 1,000 tickets for the general public. What's happening now is some of the resellers, they discount prices into the race. I think that's just what happens, I, her assumption, with live events as we get closer to this event. I think from Liberty and F1's point of view, it's a huge success financially. Um, they have sold out the tickets. 
They also have brought in new sponsors as a result of the Vegas race. American Express, for instance, just signed on as an F1 sponsor. T-Mobile has recently signed on as an F1 sponsor. So they're not framing it that way at well, all. I'm sure they're and not, I but what about, the, what about the hotel companies? Because it's it seems to me that the hotel companies are the ones that are struggling the most. They had obviously reserved, reserved rooms at very, very mm -hmm. high prices. They're now actually selling those those rooms at much lower prices, and they're, it looks like estimating that for the weekend, in terms of like room rates, it's not going to be that different than a normal weekend. And it's I wonder down. what that portends for the future. I think it's a handful of hotel companies, and I think the strategy, the miscalculation there was that they they waited too long to release them. So I spoke for this documentary to Craig Billings, the CEO of Wynn Resort. So that's at the high end. They didn't even put many hotel rooms out for sale to the public. They have 5,000 rooms between Wynn and Encore. Most of them were already booked up by corporates, sponsors, room blocks, partners, which shows where the demand is in this case. It comes at the high end. It comes from the corporate sector. I think for the individual who wasn't able to plan the race or get a ticket, things have come down. But again, there was very, very little made available and it came out very late because I think there was, they overestimated how, how strong demand would be just in the immediate run-up. Okay, Sarah Eisen, check out the documentary. It is tonight at 8 Eastern Time and Pacific right here on CNBC. It's called Inside Track, the business of Formula One. Looking forward to uh, watching it live or set your DVR.